On the 9th of December, a crew of six RAF servicemen lost their lives on the hillside above Trivel. This is their story. It is a tribute to their bravery and selfishness sacrifice in serving their country. We dedicate it to their families and hope that it goes a small way to assuring their families that their loved ones have never been forgotten in this corner of Wales. World War II broke out in 1939 following the German invasion of Poland. The RAF were involved from the start, both in the Battle of France and leaflet dropping over uh, France and the Low Countries. After France was invaded, the RAF extended more into the bombing area and bombing raids took place as far into Germany as Berlin and uh, predominantly in the early stages on the coast of France where the targets were the U-boat pens and the German defences. The crew of T2520 of 115 Squadron were based at Royal Air Force Marham in Norfolk. As with many of the crews, they were very young men. The pilot was Pilot Officer Albert Tyndall, service number 43294, from the Rockdale suburb of Sydney in New South Wales, Australia. Although only 21, he was an experienced flyer, having flown several missions to Berlin and Hamburg. His co-pilot was Sergeant David Mills, service number 748521, from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Sergeant Hilton Daniel Ellis, service number 523372, of Dinnington Colliery, County Durham, was the navigator. Sergeant Stanley Gordon Howard, service number 966313, was the wireless operator. Sergeant David Ernest Wallace, service number 905336 of Southend-on-Sea, and Reginald Brown, service number 40913 of New Zealand, were the air gunners. The crew of Tango 2520 left RAF Marham on the evening of the 8th of December 1940 as part of a bombing raid on Bordeaux. After a successful mission, they were returning to their home base when they encountered horrendous weather. The rain was torrential, thick fog covered the landscape, and visibility was virtually nil. The aircraft had little in the way of sophisticated navigation equipment uh, that's associated with modern aircraft. Tango 2520 lost touch with the rest of the squadron. Many years ago, 1949 to 1950, I went to the RAF and I worked after a while, after training, on Wellington Bombers as an instrument fitter. They had taken off from the east coast of Britain in the dark of the afternoon in December, flown over the north of France to Saint-Nazaire, bombed the U-boat pens, dropped their bombs somewhere and were heading home. And the poor beggars thought they were going back to Norfolk. But of course they weren't. And they were going back to Wales and their death. The blackout, the horrendous weather conditions, gave no visible indication to their location and the aircraft ended its flight above Ustrid Quarry in Treville. In the beginning of the last war, the RAF had terrible trouble because at night they couldn't, didn't know where they were dropping their bombs, frankly. They had two instruments of any consequence. The one was the altimeter, which should have told them how high they were above the ground, and the other was a compass, which should have told them what direction they were going in. And both of these have got great faults. The compass can only tell you where north is, but it can't tell you which way the aircraft is going. The reason is the aircraft is like a ship at sea. It floats in the air. So it might be heading one direction, but it's actually drifting way across country. It was a bad night, and that's exactly what had happened. They were on a compass bearing, but they weren't on the course to Norfolk. The second failing was the altimeter. 
which wasn't the sort we have now, which are radar altimeters, which tell you how high you're above the ground. They were barometer altimeters, which told you the height of sea level. It had been set to zero in Norfolk at near sea level. So when they came up over here at about 1,400 feet above sea level, in pitch dark, pouring rain, having flown from, I think it was what happens four in the afternoon, I think, until what happens two the following morning, they had no idea where they were. They were cold, it was pitch dark, freezing, and they, I think they must have known that they'd, they'd had it. Their last message was that they were going to reduce height to save fuel. Well, uh, it was probably the home guard. Uh, from, from my recollection, the home guard was the first up there. Because he's on duty that night, look. And it was in the middle of the night sort of thing. There was a big blaze, of course, so I don't know who saw that. I don't know. The fire, you know, the fire lit up in the sky and and everything. And yeah. But it was a canvas, a canvas plane anyway, isn't it? I think a uh, canvas-covered plane, so it probably would blaze quite uh, easily, I should think. I mean, Tom Perkins... He was the dumper driver, look, see. He told me he brought the bodies down, sit to the substation or the or that place. Uh, the was the compressor. Uh, yes, they were all yes. put in the compressor. I remember him saying that he brought the six bodies down, look. Not I mean, uh, that crash was a long way from the quarry. All but, of course, the quarry have advanced since then, uh, so the quarry is much nearer uh, the, the crash yes, now. Yes, it is. It's right by here now, look, the quarry is now, look. It's all scattered over there. It's all it's scattered. scattered there. There. It's all, like you say, only the tail plane was whole. Uh, There's an engine, you have an engine over that way. The cockpit engine. area was still vertical, you know, mm -hmm. but it had burnt out. Yeah. The framework was there, yeah. mm -hmm. but of course, uh, I, I think it was canvas covered, wasn't it? The, the Wellington. So that had all burnt off, you know, so it was just the cockpit frame, you know, uh, was there standing vertical. Yeah. Yeah. You know. When I first saw these pieces of aircraft fragment around and recognised what they were, I noticed that I wasn't the first to have noticed this, and that on the ground in the middle of plus the most densest patch of debris, there was a tiny cane, foot high, few stones and this minute little cross made from twigs, which somebody obviously just managed to pick up and record it. So clearly somebody had had feelings similar to mine and done something out there. there. I had no idea who it was, but obviously he was affected, or she, I don't know, was affected in the, in the same way. Both because the uh, the loneliness of the place, guys up there in the pouring rain and swirling mist, and they, what the feelings must be going through their minds of this loneliness of hours and hours and hours droning away in pitch dark and freezing cold. I felt that I had to sort of do something. So I made a little cross <clears throat> of a piece of oak that I had, and I engraved a little brass plate with an inner bomber, and I set it up with a colleague who lives and friend who lives a couple of doors from, from me, David Jones come up and help me set it up. And it's been ever since, and I've taken a wreath up every year, and in recent years the council has also put a wreath on it. In 2010 there were two special events to commemorate the, the air crash and the crash in this bomber. The first was a service down in St George's Church which brought it home to everybody, the significance of that event. It was a very, very moving occasion with over 250 people actually attending, including members of the RAF from St. Athens and from Margam. Oh, no. 
following day, a walk took place to visit the site where the bomber actually crashed. Very, very moving um, occasion. As everybody walked to the top of the mountain, the mist was down and you felt as if you could have been a member of that flight, not actually knowing where you was going, because it took us about 10, 15 minutes to actually find the site. Within minutes of getting to the top, everything cleared and you could see how close they were to the summit, how they only had 10 more feet to go. And it also showed you the surroundings that they actually find themselves in. Before returning, we actually laid the two reeves. The reeves were placed amongst the little bits of wreckage which were actually left there today and amongst the scorch marks which are there to be seen 70 years after this crash. Thank you.